church family this morning. If you're new, maybe a first time visitor, I'd love to meet you in the lobby after service. And uh, man, we're so glad that you made it a point to come here. But here's what we do. We hope it feels like home and like family to you. And uh, we say it all the time. We work really hard for it to feel like home and like family. I don't know if you realize this, but the, the church of God was meant to be a family, the family of God. Some churches, they become country clubs, you know what I mean? Yeah, like some churches, they just become a bunch of groups of people that think they're better than everyone else. That's not that's not why we're here. That's not why we exist. No, we, we all accepted the fact that we're all messed up. And this is going to offend some of you. This is going to offend some of you, myself included, right? We're all just a, a, a dysfunction. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Kale. Yeah, that's a little, a little too loud on the amen there. Amen. Just relax. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, it just totally, you just, my whole rhythm, everything. Goodness gracious, I feel like I'm preaching left handed. Now, we are so glad uh, for this place. We're so glad uh, to be a people uh, that is about what we're for, not about what we're against. You know what I mean? I was just talking to someone uh, earlier out on the patio about that. Like, we're, we're a church that's about what we're for, not about what we're against. We're not, we're not some angsty church that's, that's trying to be just this, this, this radical voice in the dinner. We're, we're a gospel church, a lover of people, a lover of Jesus. We try to keep things simple. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't plugged in yet, please plug in. Because you weren't created to do life on your own. You were actually created for the purpose of community. And so... I just want to say again a special welcome, even for those that are tuned in online, watching by way of Facebook and YouTube and our app. Come on, let's welcome our online audience today. Amen. I, I want to share a word with you today out of the Old Testament. Um, my, the title of my message is Seizing the Moment. How many know if you live life long enough, God is going to call you at some point in your human experience to seize a moment? It could be argued that life is actually measured by the moments that you seize. In fact, your walk with Jesus might be measured in certain seasons by the moments that you seize. Are you going to be bold and take the step? Are you going to ask her to marry you? Are you going to take that step and to start serving? Are you going to say yes to that job? Are you going to be disciplined with your finances? And the list goes on and on. But it really, a life, if you think of it this way, is a culmination of the moments that you seize. Um, there's a really incredible story I absolutely love, of the, a true story of the 1980s Olympics. Uh, remember the story? There was the there was the U.S. hockey team and this this like giant of an athletic uh, team. They they like had been ruling in sports. The Ru Russian team. You guys remember that? They made a movie about it. Y'all remember the Disney movie, The Miracle? It's like an incredible movie. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite sports movie. I believe it's Kurt Russell has the worst haircut ever. It's really weird looking pants, but he's just like this fired up coach. And and the reason it fires you up so much is because the U.S. team had everything against them, all the odds stacked against them. And what the triumph of the story is, is how they defied all of those odds to ultimately win. And so that stirs something in me. I believe for many of us that are familiar with those types of stories or movies, there's a very specific reason that these movies stir something inside us. And ultimately, it's because there's something inside us that loves the underdog narrative. When, when someone with no name becomes a no name, it stirs something triumphant within us. I think one of the reasons we love these stories so much is many of us go through life and we don't feel like we can ever experience that. Maybe we feel like the underdog. We feel like the person like with all the odds stacked against us with no way to ultimately triumph. And the good news for us today is we do have a way. We do have a victory. Amen? Amen. And if we don't know, if you don't know today, it's okay because we're going to discover it together. And so we're going to be looking uh, today at a, a girl in the Old Testament, a young girl who ultimately faced, in a sense, her own giants and found a different, a measure of success that, that didn't just benefit her, but ultimately it saved and rescued a nation. 
It's an account of someone that I would say is an underdog who was more than just a victim of her circumstance, but ultimately believed that her overwhelming circumstance could actually make a difference. And so in the text we're going to be reading today, and it's a book, it's in a book that's 10 chapters long, and our heroes today, her her name is Esther, our underdog's name, I should say, is Esther. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to kind of give some background from where we're going, and then we'll read the text. Does that sound good? Does that sound good to this half of the room? Yes. Sweet. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice. We've gathered here, God, to experience you. I believe there's maybe even people in the room this morning that don't actually know why they gathered here. Maybe they thought they were brought here or drug here or or here by chance or mistake. But God, I believe that you've designed it specifically, tailored it to have every single person in here for such a time as this. So what does that mean? Why have you brought us here? I believe you're going to reveal the answer to us in today's conversation. And so God, um, we pray that you would be speaking. We want to listen. We're going to allow your word to go forth. We're going to receive it with gladness and we're going to receive it expectantly, not hoping you might do something, believing that you will do something. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. amen. Now, if you're like me, some of you have a reason Um, you have an underdog narrative. Like, when you consider your life, you consider yourself an underdog. There's an area of your life you're just, you've maybe lived your life, maybe for a while, maybe years, maybe it was because of your upbringing, that you look at your life through the lens of an underdog. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll give you an example. This was me growing up. Now, I uh, grew up uh, in the metro Detroit area, Lake Orion. My dad retired uh, from GM, the GM plant in Lake Orion, moved us up to the whitest place in the world, right? Indian River, most of you guys know the story. Um, Vastly different area than Metro Detroit to a quaint little town called Indian River. Anybody know where that is, by the way? Okay, okay. Now there's a reason for that, that there's only like two hands that went up. (laughs) It's because the town at the time was like 1,200 people, like super small, super tiny, this quaint town with incredible people, but also a very isolated town with very ignorant people. You know know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I didn't love it there, which is why I didn't stay. I didn't love it there. Eventually, I moved to the big city, Traverse City. (laughs) It was like the booming metropolis for me. It was just like, oh my gosh, three-story buildings, you know? (laughs) And so I moved to, eventually moved to Traverse City, but I I, I didn't love it there. Now, there's several reasons I didn't love it there. Now, there were nine of us in our home, living in a trailer, not including our pets, which we had dozens and dozens of pets, way too many pets. And not like dog, like, okay, crazy dog lady, crazy cat. No, 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 goats, horses, rabbits. It was unreasonable. 40 chickens, y'all, disgusting creatures. So we had, so we had this little quasi farm, which by the way, my dad started and he hated the whole time that he had it. I'm like, this was your idea. And so we lived on these 10 acre plot in the middle of nowhere. Here's how in the middle of nowhere, no one I said uh, Indian River, two people raised their hand. They're like, I think I know where that is if it's the right town, I'm thinking, because it's tiny. We lived on the outskirts of Indian River. So like boonies, 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 no one there, very isolated. And it just, it was such a vastly different area. Really none of us, none of our siblings, we didn't love it. And there were several different reasons. Now here's what's interesting. I had mentioned before, great people there. And there was a very small remnant of very stupid, ignorant people there that loved being ignorant, especially in the context of the color of my skin, which didn't make it fun for me. But here's what's interesting. As ignorant as some of those people would be, I never heard the following phrase from anybody. I've never heard even those ignorant people tell me, you are nothing but worthless trailer trash. Not once. Now, why do I share that? Because... Even though I never heard it, even from the most ignorant people, I believed it in the deepest part of who I was. Now, I wasn't taught this. Like, my parents, like, weren't giving me this kind of, like, my dad is, like, the most positive. He's like a birthday clown, y'all. Like, he's just, like, he's, like, the most positive person ever. And I think I shared before, like, he literally would, like, the whole time, he just beat uh, stage three cancer, by the way, by the grace of God. Yeah, it's awesome. (laughs) 
And like the whole time he was going through chemo, he was like cracking chemo jokes every time I call him. Like, Dad, you can't crack chemo jokes. Like, that's not okay. That's who he is. He's going to make everything a party. He's going to make everything fun. I want to be like him when I grow up, if I ever grow up. But so I, this, isn't, this wasn't the reinforcement that I was getting, getting at home. Like, like, it was encouragement. It was like, my dad's like, you can be, he's like one of those, you know, you work hard, you can, you can be it, you can accomplish anything, you can be whatever you want to be. So, so where did this come from? It wasn't from my siblings, it wasn't from the ignorant people, it wasn't just from random people, it wasn't from a teacher, it wasn't from my pastor, it was from me. Some might argue it was from the enemy, it was a lie that I believed that I was worthless trailer trash, and it didn't, it, it didn't happen overnight. Now, it didn't help that we lived in a trailer. Nothing wrong with the trailer, by the way, but living in a trailer didn't help that narrative that was in my head. Living in the middle of nowhere, and then also, by the way, it should come as no surprise, really didn't have, like, any money whatsoever. And so this changed everything about the way. I went from doing really, really well in school to doing awful in school because I believed that because I was worthless trailer trash that I was also completely stupid. And then later when I went to college, I did really, really well in college because what I learned was I'm not actually stupid because I was no longer in the environment that I had developed that mindset that I was worthless trailer trash and therefore I was stupid. So everything for me changed in a moment. And so the truth was I believed a lie that there was a life, a quality of life, opportunities that I just couldn't have, that I just didn't have access to simply because of the zip code that I grew up in, the town that I grew up in, the, the outskirts of the outskirts of the outskirts that I grew up in, that there was just a life that, that wasn't for people that were in that kind of environment. Now, why do I share all that? Because in a very real way, this is a similar environment that our character and our story, our underdog, ultimately grew up in. And so let me set the, the biblical scene of our narrative today. And so Israel finds themselves, like so often in their history, in captivity. They're in captivity in this text that we're going to be reading in Esther for about 100 years. The year is 470 9 BC, and their captors of the people of Israel, God's chosen people, were this ruthless, vile, intense group of people that were, were so famously ruthless, they're still making movies about them today. This is the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire was led by a tyrant king, a ruthless tyrant king who was a drunk, who was a womanizer, all around horrible human being named King Xerxes. And so the, this re region of Persia, um, under they, they had taken over this region. They'd taken over uh, 15 million Hebrews. And so this is not an easy life or a safe life for them. In fact, many of the Hebrews of this region, when they were conquered, they would actually hide their, their uh, Jewish heritage because of how they would be mistreated. They would be considered or regarded as second-class citizens or even no-class citizens. And so, um, so th all of this movement is led by this tyrant, childish king, King Xerxes. So famous, by the way, was his ruthlessness. We actually have evidence, not only in Scripture, but also texts and information uh, outside of Scripture about his ruthlessness. I'll give you an example. So he actually hired someone to be in his chambers with a giant axe. And if anyone did the following, he would cut off their head. If they came without being called, if they offended the king, if they brought bad news to his chambers, or even questioned a decision he made, off with their heads. Y'all only thought you had a really bad boss. That's about the worst boss you could ask for. And this horrible boss even was just so, so despicable, he banished his wife from his own kingdom. Now some of y'all are like, but why, Pastor John? As if there's a, you know, there's a good reason for that. Here's, here's why this terrible king banished his wife. Because uh, King Xerxes one night got drunk with all of his buddies. And then they, he called his wife in and said, hey, I want you to just like flaunt yourself and dance for us. And she had the audacity to say no. So, divorce. And this is actually where we pick up on our story. This is where Esther comes into our story because now King Xerxes needs a new wife. 
Out with the old, in with the new. And so what does King Xerxes do? He, he uh, calls for this parade of women, in fact, a hundred young girls, to come through and, and basically parade around. And he's going he's gonna to pick himself out one, because apparently that's what people did back then, a despicable man. And so uh, we have uh, the, all of these women. They come through, they tour through, and who does King Xerxes choose? Well, he chooses Esther to become queen. Now, what do we know about Esther? What do we know about her heritage? Esther is a young Hebrew girl. She lost her parents when she was very young. And so now she's actually being raised by her cousin Mordecai. Mordecai this is this great character in our story who basically became a father figure to Queen Esther. And so through her life, raising her, teaching her. And so she's raised, and, and so Xerxes takes her as uh, take, takes her as his wife and as her queen, and there's actually not a whole lot within their story within the first five years of their marriage that is worth noting, except for this brewing conflict between her father figure Mordecai and this final character named Haman. Haman was the second in command of the per- these Persian people. This, this people group that had conquered these Hebrews. And he was the, he was the right hand. He was kind of like the bully sidekick. And he was a miserable human being. There was this growing conflict between Haman and Mordecai. They didn't just dislike each other. They hated each other, which ultimately produced this tension between their families for generations, almost like a biblical version of the Hatfield and the McCoys. You know what I'm saying? And so Mordecai, he worked in the palace, and and Haman was the second in command of the whole empire, which means even though they didn't want to see each other, they had to see each other a lot. And so our story begins to take off when everything comes to a head, where Haman makes this new law, passes this new rule, where whenever he comes into anyone's presence in his empire, they had to bow down and worship him. And Mordecai, he pushes back. Why? Well, he clings to his Jewish heritage. I'm only going to bow to the Lord, right? And so he pushes back. And Haman has like the worst reaction, like terrible twos, bratty little kid, worst, this is a grown man, worst reaction ever. Here was his reaction. It wasn't words. It wasn't fists. No, he builds 75 foot spikes in his backyard and says, I'm going to first impale Mordecai on the 75 foot spikes and then all the rest of the Hebrew people in this nation, which I will remind you, 15 million. A little bit of an overreaction, right? Okay, so what happens? Mordecai sends word to Esther. Esther, your influence, you can make a difference here. You can make a difference here. You can do something here. Now, before we jump into our story, I want us to take careful note that there is nothing, this is so important, that there's nothing reputable about this Hebrew people. Most likely, in fact, most theologians agree, this was a season of, of the, the, um, uh, the people of Israel, this Hebrew people that gotten taken over, that God basically allowed to get taken over because of their lukewarm state spiritually. So when we say people of Israel, when we say Jewish people, don't think like devout, hyper-religious. Most people were more like religious in this time because it was customary, not because of a deep connection, a deep abiding devotion to the Lord. Does that make sense? And this was also true, by the way, for Mordecai and for Esther. That's going to come into play later. So tuck that away. Now let's go into our text. You're like, finally, read the Bible. Stop talking. I get it. I get it. We need some backdrop, guys. Context is important. Okay, Esther, check this out. Esther chapter 4, verse 10. So Esther sends word back. She instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. And when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Watch this. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. 
And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so how does it all end? How does it all end? Well, I'm not actually going to tell you that. (laughs) I want to encourage you to go and read the rest of the story. But that's not actually the point of the message today. Isn't that frustrating? (laughs) So what's the point of the story? What matters are that the characters involved, let's just talk about Esther and Mordecai, at best have a lukewarm relationship with God at best. That these two people had all the odds stacked against them and decided in this moment to get serious, to make a decision, no matter the outcome. To choose to see the opportunity presented to them, even though it was a a, a pretty awful situation, as God's opportunity, God's plans laid out for them. And so if you are a note taker, I want you to write some notes down. How do we measure success? How are we going to seize some moments in our life? To answer that question, I want us to consider how Mordecai could have responded, how Esther could have responded in this situation. Let's talk about Mordecai. My hands are tied. Mordecai could have just been like, I haven't walked with God. My daddy didn't walk with God. My granddaddy didn't walk with God. I, I, we said we're believers, but we're kind of all hypocrites. I never got married. I never have kids. All I have is this adopted daughter who I just handed over to this tyrant king who thinks he's a god who's kind of a pervert. And so now I don't really know what to do. And now because of it, uh, 15 million of my tribe, my people are going to die because I'm a stubborn man. And so you know what? Let's just call it. Let someone make some herbal tea, play a country playlist, and we'll, uh, we'll ride off into the sunset. You see, but many of us, when we're faced with these kind of situations, we revert to that mindset, that surrender, that like, right? And Esther, by the way, could have played the same game. Esther, someone that we call like this this amazing hero in the faith, she could have done the exact same thing. Like, I'm just a young girl. I'm I'm married to a king. I don't have any authority. I've never had any real authority to make decisions. People have always made them for me. And I've lied about my heritage. And I don't have this deep, rich faith. All of this is out of my control. The situation is big. And I am small. And what I love in the text that we just read is Mordecai's directive and Mordecai's encouragement to Esther is ultimately the same reality and truth and question that every single one of us in our experience here on earth as followers of Jesus will have to face. And here it is. Esther, church, perhaps God has placed you, placed us where we are for such a time as this. Friends, for you, seizing the moment will require at times for you to find, for you to look for your for such a time as this moments. What if I told you that you are in the seats that you are in, that you are in the service that you're in, that you're experiencing what you're experiencing right now today in this moment, not as an act of your will, but by an act of God's. Not by your hands, not by your physical ability to drive to a church building, but by the hand and the will and the providence of God. That's what we're talking about. God's providence, the reality, the belief that God is so big, so powerful, so holy, that his ways are so much higher that in that he, we said this before, has stacked the deck in your favor and is lining up your life to point to him, lining the reality of your life, the story of your life for your good, by his grace and for his glory. What if you don't work where you work because I didn't get the job that I actually wanted? I, didn't, I, I, I was trying to get this job, but then I just landed in this job, and I just hated this job. But what if you were right where you were for such a time as this? You're in your cubicle. You're with those coworkers you hate for such a time as this, that God has a purpose, that God has a mission, that God has a plan. Even in what we don't like, even what we hate, even in the relationship that hurts our heart, even in our pain, what if God has a purpose? 
What if God has a plan? What if God has a mission, even in the mysteries of our life? What if God has providence that he's wanting to work in and through your life? You see, some of you, you're in relationships. You're like, I don't even know why I'm friends with this person. I don't even know why I'm still married to this person. We've been talking about getting divorced. And we've been just, we don't, you know, and you've been so on the verge, and you've been so on the verge in very meaningful relationships, and God says, I actually have a plan and purpose for this relationship that you, need to, you think you need to be done with. I have a mission. I have a plan and purpose. And when you start considering the providence of God, even the most frustrating people in your life, in your circle, in your family, you're looking for the God opportunity. Because God doesn't waste time. God doesn't waste people. God doesn't waste situations. He either wants to change the situation, change it, or change you through it. That's his providence. That's how his providence works. So once you start looking at your life via the lens of God's providence, everything in a moment for you can change. Your patience level can change because God has a mission and God has a plan, even in the pain, even in the unknown. God's going to be doing something. He's doing something supernatural. I can't see it. Maybe I can't even feel it. We're going to come back to that idea in just a moment. Just tuck that away. We're going to come back to that. So... We need to be looking for, our, for such a time as this moment. And can I tell you, it's not always big moments. It's not always these super spiritual moments. So many of us, you don't, don't we? We look, we want the stars to align. We want the clouds to form letters. Give us the direction and God's plan for our life. Sometimes it happens, but it usually doesn't. That's not what our walk with Jesus is marked by. That miracle after miracle. Now, now. Because it's, it's in the small things, which, by the way, are still miracles. We don't call them miracles because they're small, because they're mundane, because they're every day. So and most of the time, believe it or not, we don't even give God credit for it. We're going we're gonna to come back to that idea in a moment. But, but we need to be looking for our, for such a time as this moments. Number two, we need to listen to our Mordecai's. Esther listened to Mordecai's direction and encouragement. No, Esther, God has placed you for such a time as this. Esther didn't have to listen. It'd be a much different story because God's chosen people, who Habakkuk, by the way, says is the apple of God's eye, it would have looked very different. They may have been all destroyed and wiped out. Instead, Esther responded, listened to Mordecai. And for some of us, God has placed people in your work. Like, I would say this, it this way. God tends to put people in your life to challenge us and point us to the moments that he's calling us to. Amen? And so years ago when I was uh, CC and I, we were uh, starting to think about launching a church. We weren't like sure. We were still wrestling with it. Like y'all know my background was youth ministry. 15 years I was in youth ministry. I thought I was going to be a lifer. Like I thought I was going to be like 50, 60 years old, still killing it, still relevant, somehow not a creepy youth pastor. I thought that was going to, I thought I was going to be able to pull it off. (laughs) Guys, I didn't even make it to 30. And I don't mean like I became creepy at 30. I mean, like, (laughs) I mean, I fell out of love with youth ministry at 30, right? Like, I woke up, and I used to be just like, time to change some lives of some students. And then I was waking up, and I was like, gosh, I hate these kids. (laughs) And don't be offended. I'm not the youth pastor of this church. Like, don't be offended. It's all good. We're going to hire a youth pastor someday again. It's going to be fine. But, like, my heart changed, like, overnight. I'm like, God... I don't mean to be that guy, but I'll take Jed, Alyssa, Hannah, the rest of them now. No, I didn't say that. I'm kidding. It just, they just followed us. Um, but but I, I literally, like, I just fell hard out of love. And what I began to love is what I'm doing now. But there was a problem. Because I was in youth ministry and I was preaching. I was like the secondary communicator at the church I was working at. And everyone at that church, they would call both me and our lead pastor a squirrel on crack. I know. And how many know a squirrel on crack shouldn't be leading a church, right? So like when I was done with youth ministry, I was praying about it and I knew what I wanted to do. Like I knew if God just showed up and was like, you can do anything you want. I'd be like, I want to be a lead pastor of a church. But I didn't even pray about it. 
because I knew I was like, I, I like told God, I know I'm not old enough. I don't, I don't have life, life experience. I know I have way too much energy. It's going to make people nervous and scare people away. I can never be lead. So I just like let God know that. Never like praying about it, not really like fasting or like listening to him. And, and, and God did this whole long process of, I, I'll just say it the raw way, kicking the butt of my wife and I uh, for several months uh, before we, we, we realized and stepped into our calling to launch a church. But I remember when I was still like on the fence, like I was done with youth, but I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And I got a call from my good friend who, who uh, used to pastor Kensington Traverse City, Patrick Holden. And um, he, he's like, hey, can you get together? And there was something about, like, when he called, I knew that this was going to be a God conversation. Like, there was going to be something, like, I, you just know certain, like, I'm going to get together, and then I'm going to feel convicted, or God's going to tell me to do something. I was nervous. Like, I didn't even want to pick up the phone. I pick up the phone. He's just like, hey, man, I want to I get together. When are you in Traverse City next? We get together. I'll never forget. We're at Panera Bread in Traverse City. And he's sitting across from me. He's like, dude, so tell me what's going on. And I'm like, I am done with youth ministry. He's like, oof. I can tell. <laughs> and he goes, so what's next? And I lied to him. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I, wasn't, I still wasn't ready. Like, I couldn't even admit it. I couldn't even say it out loud. I couldn't even come clean with it because I'm just like, all that was rolling around in my head. By the way, going back, this is the underdog narrative. I'm just a squirrel on crack. I'm just a hyper youth pastor. I could never. So I'm not even going to tell someone because I'm going to tell him, but I kind of want to launch a church. And he's going to be like, oh, you can't do that. You're going you're gonna to be a squirrel on crack. It's kind of like, you'll ever see Christmas story? Like, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. That's what I thought it was going to be, that, that moment. And so I was just like, I can't tell him the truth. I can't tell him. And he goes, he literally said this. I kid you not. He's looking across the table from me, and he's like, you're going to launch a church. He didn't ask me. He told me. <laughs> it was like the Holy Spirit was speaking through him, like right to my soul. Like, stop with all that. Like, you, you need to just stop with all that, the youth pastor nonsense. You, like, you need to stop right now. And I, and I literally, I just looked like just dead in his face. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. I'm like, I lied to you before when I said I didn't know. Like, I want to I wanna launch a church. And he's like, okay, yeah, I think you're supposed to launch a church. And then what happens? He makes phone calls because he knew we were, I was, we were considering uh, going in the Detroit area, connected us with Kensington pastors, Dave Wilson and, and Chris. You connected me to Craig, all of my best friends. Some of us are on our uh, pastoral board of overseers and ultimately launched our church with us and helped us launch our church. What is that? God's providence. God's providence. And so I, I want to take that idea back to our story. And so, so here's what I hear Mordecai saying in this story. Esther, God is in control. There's been a bunch of bad decisions. There's been some sin. But God is still in control. And so maybe he can use you to, to be part of, your, uh, part of his plan. So how many of you today, maybe you're looking at your life, you're saying, that's me, Pastor John, I've got myself into a situation, a group of situations, this part of my life, it's horrendous, I, I'm compromised, can I tell you, God can still use you, but like me, you may have to pick up the phone. You may actually have to come clean. You may actually have to confess something and be completely honest and transparent before the God of heaven. And then... You can step into his purpose according to his providence. And so we need to listen to our Mordecai. Number three, we need to acknowledge what we can't ignore. You need to acknowledge what you can't ignore. Now, what do we mean by that? So <laughs> God has this really annoying way of keeping his purposes and plans right in front of our face. Like his direction and what's next for us, like right in front of our face where we can't escape it. We can't ignore it. God has this way of doing that over and over, and it's on us to acknowledge it. God had laid out the directive for Esther, but she had to acknowledge and step into, in obedience, the call on her life. See, I want to go back to an idea I was talking about earlier, that, that many of us, we chalk so many of, this, uh, so many of these things up to chance, up to happenstance. I say it all the time. There's not a whole lot of coincidences inside the kingdom of God. And we relabel God's providence and plan and grace in your life as coincidence and happenstance and chance. And we remove all of that glory when we do that. No, no, no. See, so many times we think the times that it's actually the hand of God reaching out to us. 
We're having the uh, awful day and we, we scroll past something and it's that, that verse or that, that idea that just like fed our soul, that encouraged us and we're, we're feeling lonely or just having a horrible week and that person calls us out of the blue. Hey, I just felt like I just wanted to reach out to you, see how you're doing, check on you. I just wanted to pray for you. We, we think it's chance or happenstance. Friends, that is the hand and the grace of God reaching out to you. That is the spirit of God whispering to your soul, this is your for such a time as this moment. I've created you for this. I've built you for this. I've designed you for this. And I've orchestrated the reality of your life for this moment, for such a time as this. But we can't ignore that whisper. We can't ignore that reach out. We can't relabel it and say, huh, that's weird. I was just thinking about that. I was just struggling with it. I was just dealing with that. No, no, no. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for meeting me and being for me what I could not be for myself. Are you with me? And so we need to acknowledge what we can't ignore. Number four, as we close, <laughs> we need to choose, sometimes choose, a more difficult path. For us, seizing the moment, this is big, sometimes means choosing the more difficult path. Can I tell you, not just as a church, but as a society, we need to shake off and shed this idea of taking the path of least resistance, taking the easiest way out, taking the least painful route. The reason I say that is not because, well, we all need to be doing like the hardest things the hardest way. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is in God's economy, oftentimes his blessing, his abundant life, his plan for us comes from doing the hard thing yeah. and doing and stepping into the thing that other people aren't willing to do. And so true faith, true faith is action even in the faith the face of opposition. True faith is action even in the face of observation, or I'm sorry, of opposition. And so, friends, we cannot miss the moments that ultimately we were made and created for. I'm to a place and a space in my life where I would just kind of rather die doing what I was made to do rather than miss out on the moments that God would say, I built you for this. I built you for this. Now, I want to make sure I recognize maybe a type of individual that's in the room that would say, that is great for you, Pastor John. But for me, my struggle is, I, I haven't heard from God recently. Maybe for you, you were in the, the chairs this morning, you would say, hey, maybe even tuned in online, and you would say, I can't remember the last time I felt the presence of God. I can't remember the last time I felt God speak to me. I can't remember the last time that I really felt close to God. And so you're talking about this, God speaking, they're revealing this for such a time as this moment, and I don't even feel close to the God that's supposed to be speaking this to my soul. And friend, if that is you today, I have such an encouraging word for you. Because there is a hidden truth in the story in the book of Esther. And the hidden truth in the book of Esther is actually in a missing character, the most important character in the book. If you read all 10 chapters of this book, you read every part of the story, there is a key character orchestrating everything that you will not see mentioned once. And it's the God of the universe. You will not see the name of God in this famous Bible story. Isn't that fascinating? Why would God do that? Why would God even have the story authored? Now, we need to remember, the entire narrative of Scripture is about God. You can wrap the entire narrative, starting in Genesis, ending in Revelations, we've said this before, into these three words, God with us. And so a Bible whose ultimate theme, underlying theme, is about the glory of God, God with us, God revealing himself, God saving uh, his people for himself, God rescuing and reconciling everyone back to himself. At the end of the story, we punch in into the story in Esther, and what we see is a God who's never mentioned, a lukewarm people, that has no noteworthy uh, 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 admiration for the God that created them. His chosen people, the apple of God's eye, that at best have this flippant, lukewarm relationship with him. And so, why 
Why is he not mentioned? Why is he not mentioned? I want to encourage you today. One of the most significant truths of this story is that in a story, in God's word, in a Bible that is all about God, God is not mentioned. And yet, God is still the author. God is still the author. And God hadn't left his people. And God was still, through his providence, saving and rescuing his people. The apple of his eye. The people that would eventually be bring about the birth of Jesus. God rescued and saved these people. And we have a story that he isn't even mentioned in, and yet we still see the providence of God at work. What is the deeper message? That any area of your life where you find yourself looking up into heaven and saying, God, where are you? I can't see you. I can't feel you. I don't know where you are. He's still the author of your life. He is still writing a story through the attributes of your life. He is still writing a story that even in the areas and the places you feel like he's silent is going to be a testament and a testimony to his goodness and his glory. Think about King David, a man after God's own heart. And yet all of his writings, God, where are you? As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. I don't know where you are. This is a man who talked to God, was, was God's right-hand man, and he's saying, God, where are you? It's okay to feel that way as long as you understand the reality that there may be pain, there may be suffering in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? Because he's the author. Because he's still the author. And he's not done with you yet. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He's wanting to draw you into more abundant life. He has a purpose for your pain. He has a mission for all of the mystery that's in your life. Everywhere you feel like God isn't, he's there, he's present, He is here and now. And he's saying, I'm writing a story. And this part where I feel distant is a part of it. Hold on. The blessing's coming. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning as we close. I want to take a moment, and I just want to give an opportunity, as we do every week, just to give, to give you the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Maybe you're here today. You would say, Pastor John, I've never formed a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible makes it simple. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So when you turn to Jesus. Turn away from your sin. You confess it. I'm broken. I need Jesus. I need a Savior. That prayer starts a relationship, and you can start that relationship today. So I'm going to ask you to do is just to respond. How are you going to respond? On the count of three, I'm just going to ask that you just lift your hand in the air. We do this because the Word of God says, Jesus says in his Word, if you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. So do you want to walk with Jesus today? One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you all over this room, just lift your hand in the air. I want to walk with Jesus. Awesome, awesome. I see that hand. I see that hand. God sees it too. God sees it too. Anyone else? It's not too late. Yes, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, you can put your hands down. Friends, let's pray this prayer. We're all going to pray this prayer out loud to support all those that are praying this prayer for the first time. So pray with me. Say, dear Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate with all those that raised their hand this morning. It's amazing, amazing. Well, Two things I want to say before we go. As always, if you made that decision, uh, if you uh, became a follower of Jesus today, we'd love you to connect to our church. We actually uh, should have handed you a connect card. You can actually check a box that says, uh, I said yes to Jesus. Turn that in at connection point, or you can even turn it in, in the, at the uh, giving station as well. Our staff is going to respond to that card. We're going to reach out to you. I'm going to also be sending you a message. And, and we just want to discover how we can best serve you as a church and help plug you into a church. Because again... You were not supposed to be doing life alone. So be sure to plug in, get connected. There's so many ways to get involved and help you 
on this new journey of discovering what it means to follow Jesus. Not a single one of us are going to do it perfectly, but we can do it with Jesus. Amen? And so I uh, want to continue to encourage you to plug in here. Uh, our, our prayer every single week here at New Anthem, we say this every week, will always be the same, that the Lord would bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you next Sunday.